All right. So we're going to talk about the network communication. All right. So it's a very practical topic. And show uh, we're going to show you how you can use your mobile app to uh, connect to a backend server using internet and then getting the data, receive data, and then sending data. So it's really a communication between your phone and the server. And of course, you can also do that between two different phones if you consider the other phone also at the server. So it's a kind of the same idea. But most of the time, when we talk about com uh, network communication, <coughs> we're trying to focus on the mobile app supported by a backend. Now think about all the apps we're using. All right? Gmail, Facebook, Instagram, um, or some of the games. Um, it's very rare that your app is standalone without using internet today, right? Anything. Like Gmail, you need to use internet to load your mails from uh, Google's mail server. Instagram, of course. Facebook, they have server to store your images, your messages. Um, and then even games, uh, even if it's a, like a single player game, you may have your score, score uh, stored somewhere. You may have some leaderboard. You can see all those information come from the server. All right, so uh, without the backend the server support, your app, the functionality is very, very limited. All right. So basically, if you want to also have a server to uh, support your app, now first of all, you need to build a server. Now, building a server is, is, could be complicated. So we're going to show you a very simple way to do it using a good service called Firebase. Um, but also, you need to know, even if you have the server, how do you, do you communicate with the server? How are you going to send the data, receive data, what kind of product we're going to use? All right. So today I'm going to go through some of the very basic internet communication um, you know, uh, knowledge you need to know and also the coding uh, basic you need to know on um, you know, doing this. And then after that, we'll talk about how you can implement communication in Android. All right. So as you may know, we are going to talk about HTTP. All right. So that's the, probably the most important and famous uh, network protocol we use today. All right. Now, even if you don't know what HTTP is, but you probably have seen that whenever we type a URL address, we always start with HTTP colon slash slash. That basically means that we are trying to tell the browser that we're going to use HTTP protocol to send this request, to communicate. So what is a protocol? Um, it's pretty easy to understand. So basically, think about internet. Internet means we have all the computers that are connected using Wi-Fi routers and then cables, fibers. Um, so the whole internet you know, connects every single player, uh, computer and, and mobile device in the world. So that's the internet. But as we are um, trying to communicate, we're actually sharing a lot of the cables. Right? So for example, our computer right here. So you all of us connect to the, the Wi-Fi router on the wall. That router connects to the cable. Right, that, that very typical cable. That cable goes to the building, the center, central like a, a router or a switch. That one connects to the Cal Poly Pomona server. Then that server is connected to some kind of provider like AT&T. Um, I don't know what kind of company they're using. But then they probably have very big, large kind of cable that also connects to something else. Right? So that means in many cases, we're actually sharing the same cable. Like just talk about this room. So all of our devices should be sharing that cable over there. Um, but it doesn't matter if we share that. We can still do our communication separately. We can still do whatever we want. And then whatever we're sending is not interf you know, interrupting with, uh, with others. Now, the reason we can do this is because we have defined and specified a set of rules to follow. And we're sharing the, the cable and we're sharing the, the line. And if we all follow the same rule, then there won't be any issues. This is very similar to a kind of a you know, traffic rules. Like think about the highways, freeways. You know, we have also rules there. You, know, you need to go to this direction, and a carpool go to the inner line, inner lane. And then you want to like a, you know pass some car, then you, you you know you have to do certain type of things. And then for the exit, what's the best way to do the exit? So everyone needs to follow that rule. If we can all follow it, then there is no problem for sharing that road. Otherwise it's going to be uh, like very uh, you know, hard to manage. All right. So that's basically what HTTP means. HTTP basically specifies a set of rules for all the devices to follow when you're trying to send and receive information. 
And it should be only one type of protocol. There are other type of protocol like uh, uh, FPT um, you know, to handle the file. There are STMP, uh, SMTP to handle the emails. There are TCP to handle some of the basic lower level transmission. There are SSH that handle secure communication. So all of those, then this one is mostly used for the web. When you go to browser, when you go to mobile app communication, this is one of the most commonly used protocols. All right. So as I mentioned, like every time we go to the browser, you type in URL, if you choose to use the HTTP protocol to communicate, and the message you're sending is actually something like this. You will have something called the get, and then URL, uh, the HTTP version, then the host address, some of the other parameters. And then when the server got a request, the server will handle it, and then return the data in some format like this. HTTP version, 200 OK, content type, a lot of those. So we're going to cover some of this. But anyway, just for now, just know that HTTP specify the format the names, the attribute you need to do uh, while you are, you know, communicating with other server. Now this is a more detailed example on HTTP. So every HTTP you have a header, and the header you have an address, you have a get, and the master name will talk more, and some of the properties. Uh, for example, there is something called a user agent. All right, user agent basically send some of the user specific information with your browser. Like in this case, if you see user agent, it's Marisa 5.0. If you're familiar with that, that's actually the organization that built the Firefox uh, web browser. So if you see that, very likely, that the user is actually using Firefox to browse the website. And the version is 5.0. And also there's a bracket EN, standing for English. So that means for that browser, its primary language is English. Now think about it. sometimes when you go to the website and for example, or especially if you're not using English as your primary you know, language, or let's just say this, if you go to a website, for example, in German, right, it's probably mo not like set as a primary language for most of you. Now, if you go there, you sometimes see a pop-up, uh, like, uh, like a tab, asking, do you want to translate this into English, to Chinese, to Korean, all of it. And, and it looks like the, 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 the website actually knows what's your primary language. So how do they know it? The answer is yes, because when you are sending your request, you are sending the user agent. The user agent contains that information. All right. So that's why recently there are a lot of privacy issues going on. And people are actually pretty uh, sensitive right now about what they're sending. But if you actually do enough research, you can find there are quite a lot of things you can uh, find out from some of these attributes. Sometimes the combination of these headers could uniquely determine a certain user, all right? What does, what does that mean? So if I have a website, all right, you go to my website, when I look at your, your headers, I see some kind of computer like this, and I record that. And later on, when you go to somebody else's website, and then when I look at that header again, if I compare if they're the same, most likely it's actually come from the same person. So you can actually do quite a lot of things with the identification like this. But here, I just want to show you these are the things that are required to send and received when you communicate with the server. It's all specified in HTTP. Now, one of the most impor important information you really need to know when you're sending an HTTP request is the HTTP method. Every time when you send a message, you, you, a request, you need to know what kind of um, method you want to use. The most typical one is something called get, which means I want to, you know, retrieve, receive some information, or to search some information, query some information. And then you also have something called post, which means that you want to you know, post something to be saved on the server side. You also have something called delete. This is something common to use that to you know, remove the data. Um, but in HTTP specification, you have these eight different options as uh, you're sending the request to indicate the purpose of your request. Right, so you can choose any of those. And also you need to know when you're sending that request, your URL. What is that URL? Now this is something that you are already familiar with, but I want you to know the full format of URL. All right. So now when we have HTTP colon dash dash dash, that 
tells the browser that this is the product you want to use. Sometimes you don't type it, that's fine, because browser default by default use this product. And then after that, we're going to skip this one, but most times we actually have the actual domain name www.example.com. All right, that's actually the host name. From that name, I can actually find out which is the server you're talking to. Sometimes before that, you can actually pass a login user information. Especially if the server needs some authentication, you have to give the username and password. But this is very rare. Sometimes when you go to the website, and then you log in. But from the uh, HTTP specification, you can actually pass the user uh, and username and password information directly from the link. And after that, you have something called a port, specifying the a port that specific server program is ready. By default, it's something called 80, but it could be something else. I'm going to show you other examples. And then you may have another slash, and you have some other paths, like search, uh, somehow, sometimes result, sometimes anything. It could be any in the multiple levels separated by slash. And then you have a question mark, and then you have some of the parameters you're sending. Like in this case, I'm trying to search a term uh, using the language English, something like that. But then this part is something more specific to the actual request. Some of the parameters, some of the control information you want to give. Uh, but here, just keep in mind, this is the full format of URL. This is everything you can send. You can actually do a lot, of, even though we most times don't send all of those. But the most important elements are number one, protocol is important, you need to know. Number two, the host. And number three, the port. And number four, so the pass uh, plus the parameters. All right, so we're going to show you some of those examples. But as we talk about HTTP requests and then communication, every request needs to know that full URL. And then finally, once you've got a response from the server, the server will also fo follow some of the format. And to give you uh, something most important is 200. OK, that means the, uh, uh, the, re the return status. So basically, once the server receives your uh, request, was that request successfully handled, processed? Uh, if so, we're going to give you 200, which means a good, successful uh, you know, uh, handling. So sometimes when there's something going, goes wrong, you might see something called a 404, file not found, you have something called 500, you know, internal errors. The different code represent different status. But 200 is really the thing you want to see, which means a successful request is uh, it's kind of handled. And after that, you get some other information like date, the tag, uh, connection, and eventually you get the actual data. All right, so let me show you actually in, in action what does that mean when we're trying to send some of the HTTP requests, all right? So the easiest way is this, all right? So I go to Google. The moment I type and hit enter to this address, I see the page. This is an HTTP request process. So once I type my URL, I hit enter, I'm actually trying to use my web browser to send that request to Google server and the Google server respond with me their Google's homepage. All right. So in Chrome or other browser, you, you can actually open something called developer tools. And then what can what you can do here is actually see exactly what's the request and response going on here. All right. So I am going to refresh this. All right. So this time I'm going to run this URL again. As you can see, once I hit enter, a lot of things are going on. Every single line here represents a one request and response. All right, so let's click on the very first one, which is the most important. As you can see, this is actual header I'm sending. This is the URL, request message get, and then I got the response code 200, and some of the headers, including the user agent, as you can see. Uh, Macintouch, uh, Intel, Mac OS, and Apple WebKit, Chrome, a lot of information about this specific computer. So these are all sent together to uh, the server. And then the response, so it looks like something like this. And it's basically all HTML code. 
and plus JavaScript and also CSS, right? So these are the things that Google respond to us, and then that's why we can actually see this whole page here, because this page has been implemented using this um, using this uh, HTML code. Let's see. So Google send us back this one, and then when the browser read this, the browser can actually render it in a page like this. All right, so that's how the HTML works. And then to give you a kind of a different feeling on HTTP, I can also run it in the command line. All right, so in Mac, I can actually use something, some command called curl, C URL, and I can do HTTP colon slash slash www.google.com and same thing. All right. And then if I do this, I hit enter, I got exactly the same response. Like all the HTML code uh, printed out in my console. All right. So this one, uh, exactly the same process as what I did in Brother. The only difference right now this terminal doesn't know how to render this, so I can't really see the web page. But the communication part is the same. There is one send, there is one respond. All right? That's how you can actually see this HTTP request. So that shows that HTTP request can be sent from any devices, any client. It can go from the browser, can also come from the terminal, and later on we're also going to see you can also send that through your mobile app. All right, so that's, that's the idea. All right, now, since you under, once you understand this, we're gonna look at how do we send this in Java. Now, if we can do this in Java, you pretty much can do it in Android, all right? So there are different ways to do it in Android. I think currently the most uh, typical way is to use this class called URL connection. I think this is a part of Android. Uh, from the standard library, I think you can use this one to send connection, uh, send a HTTP request. Let's actually test this. I think something like this. Let's try. All right. So I'm going to come back to my Android and create a new project. I'm going to call this Lesson 5 Network Communication. All right, so let's take a look at an example. So this time, I want to send the same thing through my mobile app and talk to Google, all right? So I can just build some kind of a very simple UI. Right, so I'm gonna switch this to uh, linear layout, orientation vertical. So I'm going to do a button right here at the top. And then here I'm going to make a um, test view just to show you the actual result. All right, give an ID here. Result, text view. All right. Now, in my code, what I want to do is I will have a button, send button. I have a text view, send te uh, result, text view. And then we we'll do the very typical way, find view by ID. And then we've got a result.
All right. Now what we want right now is every time when you click on the send button, we want to send a request to Google and want to see the actual response. So the way to do it is we're going to use this class called URL connection. So let's just copy this code here. I think that that's the thing we want. All right. So you got a URL class. That's the address. I'm going to change that into Google. And then here you open a connection. And then here you can get the response and turn that into an input stream. And from here you can read the input stream. And then you can turn that into a string. Right. So I can check like Java input string to string, how do we do that? IO utilities, uh, I don't think we have those. All right, so there are all different ways. Let's just see. Let's see if we have the I/O utilities. No, we don't have it. We need to add a dependency, and then how about this? Do we have this? No. Nope. And a scanner also works. This one should work. It's a pretty standard way to do it. So let me try this. All the two string. Right, so this one is input string. Change it. Alright, so a lot of exception to handle, so why don't we just wrap everything? And then exception. And then if we do got a result, the result will be saved as a string. So I can use that to set my text view. So result text view dot set text and the result. All right. Finally, let's not do this. All right. So let's try it. All right, guys. I copied a bunch of code, but it's pretty straightforward. The most important part is here. You get you you specify the URL you want to visit, and then you create the instance of HTTP URL connection and you call something called open connection and that's going to load everything here once you try to get input stream from that connection and then send that to the buffer input stream you can have a loop actually to load everything eventually you turn that into a string once you got a string you set that into a test that's it this part of the code is very standard you can just you know find it and copy and use that all right so I want to test this you know. All right, so here is our UI. So I'm gonna click on this button. Let's see if we can get the same Google response. All right, so nothing happens. And let's actually check if we've got any errors here. All right, so it looks like we do have some errors, but then the problem is I'm actually doing this to eat everything here. All right, so you don't really see the actual 
errors. So, but then if I search fail to send the request, all right, so that definitely failed to send it. So let's actually look at the errors. All right, so there are some errors. So let me clear this. And then try this again. I'm going to click on send. All right, so that fails. And then let's see why it fails. Oh yeah, because I don't, I, I didn't really print the message. So, let me do this. All right, do this again, send. All right, so that's actually better because I actually eat everything, so I, I only actually care about the 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 um, um, this exception we already know, but this is actually a random exception. So that is the crash, all right. So which is the kind of expect expected? I just want you to see the error here. What's the error here? All right. So let's see why that crash. Every time when you see a crash, go to your log. You might be able to find something. All right. This time here is the error, and it said that. Android OS dot network on main thread exception, and then if you click on the um, line, it's actually this line here where you try to get the actual data from the connection. And if we try to find more details about this, nothing really have uh, nothing else. So my question here is, if you see this exception called network on main thread exception, what does that mean? Any guesses? What do you think is a main thread? Try this again. Click on send. It's exactly the same. Error. All right. So this is something new I want to talk about here. All right. In Android, there is a important classification on the type of thread you can use. Now, first of all, the thread basically means multi-thread. And if you already learn an operating system, you know that a computer can have multiple processes running in parallel. For example, you can have your browser open where you're chatting with your friend using some other chatting software while you're listening to some of the music using iTunes or some of the MP3 uh, player software. And you can maybe also do some typing in Word. So all of these programs are different software, different process, but you can actually run them at the same time or even maybe play another game at the same time. Now the reason you can do this is today the computer has been built to support multi-process. And the same idea here for the thread. Thread is just a, like a smaller unit. And within the process, I can have multiple threads going on at the same time. And a good example may be in games. For games, you normally need a multiple, multiple thread. For example, one thread to handle the animation, one thread to handle the internet connection, talking to other uh, to the games game server, another thread to control all the display, the scores, everything on the screen, so that they can run at the same time. And the same thing for Android, because Android as a phone, you can have multiple apps running together at the same time. Right? You can still you know put, uh, listen to music, chatting to your friends, and making calls. So you can do parallel computation. And the reason to support this is uh, is the uh, thread, uh, multi thread. So with thread in Android, you can use multiple thread. You can do um, uh, create a thread and then create as many as you want. You can use thread. It actually comes from Java. So whatever you do in Java, you can also do it in Android. But in Android, uh, some something special is called new thread. All right. 
The main thread basically means the most important, the key thread Android is using for every single app. And of course, that thread receives more resource and has higher priority to execution. In many cases, we call this main thread as UI thread. Because in the Android, when you do the app development, most times we allocate the main thread to run the UI related tasks. So for example, you want to render a view. You want to show it animation. You want to show some of the color changes. All of these tasks have to be taken care of by the main thread. And also some of the user interactions. I, I click on this button, I want to show you this. I you know uh, swipe the phone and it gave me this uh, effect. All of this logic is also handled by the US thread. And I told you the US thread, the main thread, you know, has a higher priority. So that means if you use this thread for renting, Android normally guarantees this thing will execute it immediately and smoothly. So that's why we want to put all the UI stuff here because when you are using our app, you don't want your app to feel like so you want to basically have a very good responsive while you're interacting with that. So that's why we want to make sure everything related with UI goes to this thread from main thread to UI thread. But at the same time, we also want you to run multiple tasks within the form. And if you want to do the same time, do them in the same time, you do need to use multiple threads. So, except the main thread, the, the other thread you created while you're running the app are all called background thread. And you can have one or more background thread, as many as you want. And of course, it depends on how, how many uh, CPUs you have on the phone and how much memory you have. But Android will try to run them in parallel at the same time. Of course, this one always receives. So this is something you have to keep in mind, a very important uh, concept here. Now, once you understand it, there are two types of threads, main thread, UI thread, and then also the background thread. So the thing you want to learn here is Android requires that all the UI-related operations and logic should be executed on main thread or UI thread. And the network-related operations, like the thing we're trying to do here, sending a request, getting a response. It must be run in the background thread. In other words, you cannot use the main thread to use to do the network communication. Can anyone anyway explain why Android required this? Just because the network number be the one that the longest. Yes. Therefore, it's not like the first priority that's like interacting with the user at the moment. Exactly. So, you should know if you try to do something on the internet and actually load, it really depends on the network speed. It may have a long time to load a page. When you get a message, it maybe take a long time. Maybe even it's like a half second or one ten second. It's actually a long time for, for the CPU. So if you run this in here in the main thread, your main thread will be blocked. Now think about where you're clicking, you know, swiping the phone. At this time, we're trying to load in something from the server, and then your phone freezes. Because your phone is trying to run this network communication, it takes longer. That's going to give you a very bad user experience. So that's why we do not want you to run this one on the main thread so that you have, you have to put it in the background thread. So is it kind of like, let's say if I was on YouTube and I was like, with, with, with like kind of a iffy internet connection, the main like UI really is would be like whether or not I can type on the screen or type on the search bar, but like the network from the YouTube Loading. Yes, yes. Loading the video definitely goes around the background thread. It can be because the loading thing is, is consistent in, for YouTube and also takes much longer. So when you put things in the background thread, all right, so it's in a separate thread, so they can be executed at the same time. So where you are still interacting with the, with the UI, the data is being loaded at the same time. So that actually guarantees a, a best, the best experience. All right, and then with that, you might be entering. So, uh, how do we know if we're running on a main thread or background thread? Pretty simple. By default, all the code we're writing so far, all of this, 
If you don't specify anything, it goes to the uh, main thread. That's why normally we use all the code to find the view, to do the listener, to change all of this content. It, by default, all goes to the main thread, and then it runs really fast. And including this part here where you trigger all the internet connection. And then if you need to create a background thread just like this, you have to do something special. All right? So in Android, in order to try, help you to make this whole uh, uh, connection and background thread uh, really easy to do, Android give you a helper cloud to, for you to build something uh, like this. All right? So you have to know this class called async task. So this is the class specifically uh, created for Android. You don't have this in Java, but in Android you have this class. Whenever you need to do the background thread process, this is probably the only option you have because it's very, very convenient. You do not have to create a Java thread. I don't know how many of you have done Java multi-threading programming, but if not, you don't have to learn it. You just need to learn this class and then use this one because when you, whenever you put your code into this class, it will be executed in the background, and Android can actually handle it nicely and know when to run it, when to start it, when to uh, stop it, and then when to put it into the background and come bring it back. All right, so let me show you how to use the async task. So async task is a class, all right? So you can actually create a class called async task, and it's, it's generic, so I it basically asks you something like your input and output. I don't need elements. I want to show you a very simple version. So this one is loading task, and then new async task. All right. So that's a little class here. Now I create an instance, and, and you can see this class asks you to fill this method called do in background. And very easy to understand. Anything you put in this method will be executed in the background thread. So let me show you. So if I put everything into here, all right, so your network communication and everything will go through the background thread and then get the result. However, remember this line here. Once you know the result, you want to set the result this is another UI type of operation. This is not about network. This is about changing the view. So by following the rule, this line can need to go back to the main thread, not the background thread. So in order to do that, then this class actually gave you a way to specify what you want to put to the background and what you want to put to the main thread. So there is a method you can override it called on post execute, which means if you finish executing this task, then what else do you want to do? And in this case, once I load everything, I want to put the result back to here. Because this one deals with UI, and then this method will be executed in the main UI thread. All right. Now, of course, this result is not available anymore. I can just do something here to maybe create an instance variable. Result, and then I can change this so the result will be shared. All right, so once again, you start or your background thread to load the result. Once you finish that, we set that to the text view. So that's how you can create everything into this background thread. All right, and then finally, you can run this. So this one is called loading task, and I can call something named execute. And that's going to execute the whole thing. In the main background first, and then bring it back to the UI thread. So let's try this again. All right, so the same view. Now this time when I click on the button, all right, it crash again, but let's check the error. Now this time it looks like something different. So if I go here, permission denied, missing internet permission. Remember this, I showed you. Because this time you try to use the internet again, you have to give the permission. So I go back to my app, 
and then manifest file at the very top use permission internet and then let's run this one more time click on send all right so as you can see this time we got all the response here in the app now if you remember this is exactly the same thing we got from here all right in google server in html and if you open this in the browser you are able to see the actual web pages but then this is how you do the http request in android using java but it's all the same process the same logic it's just different ways to treat it so just a quick example here on how you can use URL um, connection to send requests and then get a response. Now the most important part here is understand the main thread and the background thread. All right. So let's actually do something more meaningful. Now the getting this one is not really much fun. And I was actually Googling, there is this open weather API. You can query weathers in this one here. If I find there is an API here, for example, you can do a lender's weather. So if you send a request, and you're gonna get some result like this. So we can test this same thing here. So if I simply copy this URL and I put it here to replace the Google's URL, and then if I run this again, click on send. All right, as you can see, these are the uh, weather information coming back from the weather server. All right, so it's, a, it's public, you can query it. However, if you look at this data here, does everyone know what this data is? What, what kind of format is this? JSON, right? So the next thing you need to understand as you're sending data communication to the communication is, what kind of a data format we use? Now, for example, when I show you the HTML, HTML had the syntax, right? It used all the tags. Uh, if you learn HTML, you can actually read this. Like in this case, there is a division. That's how you can, you know, have a separated section for your elements. There is something called uh, what else? There is uh, form, basic a form. You can actually send some information, but it has meaning. It has its grammar and syntax. And same thing here. Now this format is something called JSON. And let me see, I should have this slide here. So the JSON is probably the most popular format we use today to send and receive information for all the communication happening in the internet. It comes from JavaScript. Right now it has been applied everywhere. Now this is the typical JSON data example that you can see we use brackets to wrap all the data. And then the data uh, always have left-hand side and right-hand side. We call it a key and value pairs. So that one has a key specifying the, the purpose of the data and right hand has the values specifying the, the concrete data set. And in this case, my first name is wrong, last name is clear. You can also do other types of important values in the here and so You can also do complicated things like this for a phone number. You can have a list. And every item in this array is another like a compound data iPhone, and a number, a phone number. So this JSON data can be, um, you know, nasty. It can be um, really complicated to include a lot of data. All right. So to handle the JSON data, all right, you can learn something in Android that you can easily parse everything and retrieve data. All right. So for example, this one. Let's first take a look at the the output here. What does this mean? So if you if you put everything like this, it's very hard to read. Alright? But if we format this actually, there is a JSON format. And then let me just copy this and then put it here. Alright. So this is the response we got from the weather server. So you have coordinates, longitude and latitude, you have weather information, some kind of ID, and then this is the main description. And then you also have base, 
stations and then mean the temperature, pressure, humidity, uh, maximum minimum temperatures, visibility, wind, all of this information, right? So, but you may not need to use all of those, but sometimes if I want to uh, query what is the maximum minimum uh, temperature, what is the uh, description, right? I want to know this specific field. All right. So if you just consider this as a string and try to capture some information, it will be very difficult. And then we need a better way to, to manage the data and, and to parse the data to get it. All right. So that's why we need a specific library for, to help us to parse everything. That library is called um, Object Mapper. All right. So let me show you how this thing works. So right now, if I go back to the app, this is the things I, want, I have seen. But the next version, what I want to do is, I don't want to see the whole you know, data like this. I want to find out specific attributes. All right. So I'm going to create three test view. The first one is to the result, but I want to get three more. This one is the maximum temperature. This one is the minimum temperature. This one is uh, description. All right, so it's three of those. Now in my code, I want to get the result and then I will try to find all those attributes and then display that in my app. So I need three more. One is minimum, one is maximum, the other is a description. Alright, so let's take a look at how to do it. Now first of all, we need this library, something called um, object mapper. And then this is the, probably the first time we're going to use a third-party library. So this library doesn't come from an Android. It comes from the third-party libraries. So you have to basically download this, this library. All right. So how do we download the library? You have to first find out this library called Object Mapper. And then you Google something called Maven. All right. I'm going to talk about more about this. The Maven is a library Sorry, it's a tool that help us to find all these libraries. So Maven is just like a central repository that saves all the useful li library what we normally use. Now in this case, this is something called data binding. And that should be the one we're going to use. I'm going to pick the latest version. And I will try to add it to my uh, Android. Now this time, remember, I told you this Gradle script handles how you can manage dependencies. If you need to add more libraries to your app, you need to go ahead and change this Gradle file. All right. So one section, if you open this, is something called dependencies. And you have all of this, and each one will be a specific dependency. Like something like this called JUnit 4.12, meaning that you want to use this library to, you know, in your code base. This library helps you to test your software, right? So we're going to add something called this. Once we find out this library, the name and the version, and I'm going to copy this. You want to choose the Gradle because that's the tool we use in Android. Simply copy this and then put it here in this line. And then it asks you to syn synchronize your project. Once you do that, it will try to download that library and then put that into your project. All right, so it looks like it's successful. All right, if you see this warning, something like uh, new about Android, which means that we do not use a compile, we're going to use something called implementation. So. Let's not worry about this one right now. I don't want to overwhelm you, but it's basically just one type of dependency you want to use. All right. Now, once you have this, let me make sure that we have this thing called object mapper. All right. Thing we do. All right. Now we can actually use this library to help us to parse this whole class and then get information for us. All right. How do we do it? If you want to do this in Java, all right. Very simple you have to specify a class that represents this whole structure. 
right? So like in this case, I have something called coordinates, and then you need to have a class called coordinates, and then the class has two attributes, one's longitude, one's latitude. All right, let me show you an example. So coming back to my app, all right, I'm gonna create a new package called data. From here, I have something called coor. Capital letter, but I want to make sure this name or those all the same. And there are two attributes: latitude and also longitude. And then both they're both like I can use double. All right. So you have to try to match the names and also the type. And then after that, just get the getter and setters. All right. So this is how you finish with this class. And the same thing you have to do weather. All right. Now weather is a little bit different because weather is actually an array and every item in this array should be a class. All right. So the best way to do this is let's create or actually you know what let's do the other way. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to create this whole class first. I will call this I give a name because this is a whole class, this whole data doesn't have a name. So I'm going to give a name called weather output data. All right, so let's check out what are the attributes. First of all, you have a coordinates. So you have a private coord type and a coordinate. That's one. And secondly, you have a weather. So weather is a array. Uh, with a certain type. So I'm going to call this weather um, item. All right, so this one should be an array. So I can also make it as a list. All right. Of course, we don't have, have a, a weather item. So I can do that a little bit later. Now we have a base, looks like it's just a string. So private string base. Next one would be the main. Main has a lot, a lot of other things. I need to find another class. So I'm going to call this main record. Name is main. Next one will be visibility. This one is a type of proper integer. So I'm going to do int. Next one is wind. Again, you have something called wind data. Clouds. Every attribute you have to define is ET system. You have ID. And then you have name, which is a string. Finally, you have COD. Alright, so now we have to also create this class it's weather item. We don't have it, so let's create a class. Weather item is actually this one. So we have ID, main, description, and icon. So four attributes. All string. All right, and then let's get some of the getter and setters. All right, so we'll finish this one, and then coming back here, we need to do the main record. So create a class. It's actually this one. So we got some of the double. This one called temperature. This one is that's all your double. So this one will be pressure. This one, next one is humidity. And now we've got a temperate mean. Temperate max. Alright, and then let's just create a getter and setters. Alright, so 
I think two more, just three more. Win data, create a class. Win data is y is speed. The other one is degree. So again, all we're trying to do here is try to define a complete data classes for the ones you want to receive. Cloud data, something called all, and you need to have getting the setups for all of this. And what else? Final system data. All right, system data. Um, let me copy all of this. So. Type is an integer. ID is this. And then message. Country. Sorry, it's not strings. So this is a long sunset and sunrise time. And then this one is string, this one is double. And then ID is an integer. Alright, so we're done. So get on the setters. Alright, now we spend so much time basically we're building this class. Not done yet. Here, this one also need to get get in setters. All right. So you build this whole big class to represent this whole data you're going to receive. The reason I want to do this is later on the library is going to help you to convert everything you receive in stream and then put it into an object like this so that you can access them easily. Right, let me show you how you can do it. Coming back to class here. Once you get your thing from the result, you can do something called object mapper. And then from object mapper, there's a class called read value. It comes from your result, which is the string. And I want you to turn that into a weather output data. And then you can save this to be a weather of the data right here and there might be an exception let's just track it all right now once you receive this data you, you're gonna have this data object with that object you can call the method to uh, get data to uh, you know set and get all right so for example right now I have the data I can do something called get main get and sorry, no, this one. get main dot. Oh, we didn't specify that main record. Why we don't have all of this? Oh, I can't access all those. So is that because the public thing? I think that's probably the reason. All right, and then data get me get yes. And we want to like the minimum temperature, so that one go to minimum temperature. Set text. Minimum temperature is this, All right? And then we do the maximum. Finally, we also have description. It's description is in the uh, also in the main, right? Get no, it's in the uh, 
weather. So get weather, get weather item. Description. Oh, the very first one. This is the list. So we need to get the list first. Get weather dot get first one dot get description. All right. Basically, you base you base on the structure of your class and then try to find out the attributes. But then you don't need to worry about the parsing because this line should take care of the parsing. All right. So let's try. So this time let's click on send button again. Okay. Send the request. Alright, so it's crashed again and let's just check why that happens. Alright. Oh, we have an, like this line here. We haven't initialized all of this, so we have to go back to here. Let's say minimum text view is font view by ID R dot ID minimum temperature view. And a maximum, and a find view by ID, maximum, and then we have description is this. All right, find it one more time. All right, so let's click on send. If you look at this carefully, there's a maximum temperature that we have actually come from here. And minimum temperature is actually this one. And then description, light, intensity, speed. Right. So it's the same piece of data, but right now we are actually able to access and manipulate it from the air value. As you can see, the strings are pretty complicated. If you try to parse it yourself, it's very difficult. But now we actually use a library to convert the string and then put it into an object. All right, so this is the standard way to process JSON data. Most of the servers that I mentioned actually do JSON as a backend to, um, uh, to process the data um, to return the result. So you really need to know how you can, um, you know, in your Java code to receive you know, that kind of uh, uh, <clears throat> data and then use it, right? So that's what we're gonna cover here, all right? But as a quick review, guys, so this example really shows um, all the details about sending an uh, internet connection and getting it all back. So initial that it's your views, when you click, trigger a URL connection, open it, load the data, once you got the data, you, you send it, you parse it, and then save it to an object, and then use that to your, uh, inside your text. And then, meanwhile, you have to be careful whether the things you want to run in background, whether the things you want to run in main thread. Right, so the background thread, main thread is very important, besides uh, the, the permission you don't want to use. Okay, forget about that. All right, so any kind of internet connection, you have to do this in Android. So this is actually a very complicated process to take a look at. All you're trying to do is actually send one request. So next, I'm going to show you a kind of another library that can help you to really do this in a simpler way. All right, so I'm going to actually show you that example. Let's actually take a you know, very quick break. All right, so I see some of you are really tired. So let's break for uh, five minutes.